Hey guys, so for the last week or so I have been trying out Soulless Gnome Edition on the uh, Triton uh, Entraware laptop. And today I'm going to be doing one of those screencasts where I actually take it from the laptop itself. So um, basically, as you can see here, I've got the simple screen recorder out and I'm going to be sharing some thoughts about it. I don't really have too much in the way to show you guys because, I mean, it is a GNOME desktop. There are a few alterations and I think you could probably see a few of them uh, off the bat here. You can see that they have uh, actually re-implemented the tray icon in the uh, top right hand corner there. You can see the simple screen recorder icon recording away there. And that is a rather important thing because in recent days, the GNOME desktop have actually uh, depreciated and removed the what they call the legacy tray icons, I think it is, which is the icons, the little icons in the corner of a screen usually used by Skype and Steam and Discord and Simple Screen Recorder. And apparently no one uses those anymore. So, so the GNOME desktop have decided to actually just completely rip out um, the idea of having notification icons. But... Uh, they seem to have been re-implemented here in Solus in a very similar way to how they've been re-implemented in the Ubuntu desktop. And I think that going forward now with a lot of Linux distributions, there's going to be a distinction between GNOME desktop implementations that do make use of the notification icons and those that don't. And there is one application that that specifically applies to, and that is, of course, Dropbox, which uses the notification icon as its primary source of interaction with the user. Dropbox, which is something that I use uh, quite regularly because it's a very easy cloud syncing program, especially if you're sharing documents with a, with a group of users and you kind of want to try and get away from, from Google Apps as much as you can. Dropbox is like the go-to alternative. It's pretty much just as easy as Google Drive, if not easier in a lot of cases. Um, and, um, you know, and it's available natively on Linux, which is a great thing as well. But um, yeah, like for example, Pop! OS, they have decided not to re-implement the uh, notification icons and It'll be interesting to see what becomes of that, um, in all honesty. I don't really know how many people use Dropbox, but I always assumed it was like quite a lot. So, Especially given that Google Drive doesn't have native support for, um, uh, for Linux in general. Now, actually, that's, um, that's a good opportunity for me to kick off the software center, actually, because in the third-party apps, you can actually get, uh, where is it now, InSync. InSync is the native, no it's not, well it, I mean it's natively available on Linux of course, uh, but it does work with Google Drive and it works really really well with Google Drive and uh, back when I was making more use of Google Drive I actually installed InSync and it worked flawlessly. I never had a single problem with it and it never even bothered me that, you know, that, that was fine, that was everything that I needed. Um, and I, you do have to pay for the, you do, I think you do have to pay for it still. Uh, I, I did, but it was, it's a very, it's not very much, you know, and, it's, it, and it is worth it. And of course, uh, Google just off of the bat with their free, free, um, you know, their free tier of, of uh, Google Drive offer you a lot more space than Dropbox do. So, you know, you might you might even still save money in regards to that. And Dropbox is a little bit on the expensive side, and Google Drive is the cheapest chips. Like I think you can get a terabyte for like like what two dollars a month or something like that, three dollars a month. It's it's fantastic. So um, uh, yeah, I mean obviously you know I'm trying to get away from Google Drive um, and Google products in general. Not not I'm not an absolutist on the calls, but I you know like it's it's not a um an ab you know an absolute kind of thing. You get to choose you know. Obviously, I'm here on YouTube, and uh, with me, it's just it's just wherever convenient. Try and uh, you know try and see what else is available, and try and see what the competition is like. And, and you know, we all have our different reasons for it. Sometimes we just want to um, you know support you know the diversity of businesses on the internet in general. Anyway, I'm digressing. Um, there is uh, a decent amount of third-party software tools, as you can see here. There's the um, the full Google Chrome with um, Flash support and what have you, but there is also uh, the NPAPI plugin for Flash as well, which I didn't install because so few sites use Flash nowadays. And in fact, to be honest, um, it, it, it gets to the point where I, I usually disable it because it's just easier to use the HTML5 native stuff. You've got the Google Talk plugin, um, and you've got all this kind of stuff. You've got Skype. You got Slack. You got. Is there? Um, uh, I don't see Discord in there, but it could very well be available in the native um, software store here. So we can browse. Um, what have we got here? We can browse. That's the software center. So if we go, uh, here we go. We got our categories. I don't know uh, why I was in 
KDE software center, for the KDE section. Um, okay, but yeah, so a lot of people will uh, tell you that Solus doesn't really have that much in the way of applications, and that many people who once use Solus but don't anymore will often tell you that it's a great distribution, but for one piece of software or another, uh, they they weren't able to find you know what they were looking for and had to ditch it for maybe usually an Ubuntu-based distribution. Now, I have to say that I find that Solus actually includes more packages that I usually have to pull in from third-party sources on Ubuntu distributions um, than anything else. Like, this is a very current distribution, and it may, might not have, in terms of quantity, the same number of packages that Ubuntu has. I think that the, the, the selection process and the, the, actually, the actual applications that are selected uh, suit a desktop user better than most other distributions. And I'll, I'll give you an example. If you look at the games category, uh, and um, you want to look at, uh, what are we looking at here? Uh, main games collection, right? So you've got things like, you've got gnome games there. You've got Lutris. How many distributions have Lutris in the repositories as native? You've got mind test there. Mind test is always uh, a good uh, a good laugh. SC controller. If you've got a Steam controller, um, SC controller is a great application that lets you use the Steam controller without Steam. You can use it on, on any application. Um, you can even use it as a mouse. And actually, the Steam controller works pretty well as a mouse. If you want like a couch computer setup, and you want like basically something with the functionality, you know, the full functionality of a computer, but you want something that's a little bit easier to use, you know, putting like Solus GNOME on a laptop. Or so you know, and, and um, or so, you know, Solus GNOME on a machine, and then uh, using using an HDMI cable to wire it into a TV, and then using the Steam controller with SC controller as a, a remote control. Effectively, you can do a lot worse. Uh, so uh, you have got Lutris, you have of course you've got Steam SC controller, you've even got the itch. Uh, you got the itch client. Now I don't know if you guys are familiar with itch.io, but it is it's a it's more of a um, it's more of a platform for smaller games creators. You see a lot of games jams on it, but it's just like, you know, it's it's Steam, but for, for a different audience. It's uh, natively available on Linux, and the client itself is open source, admittedly an Electron app, but it's open source, and it's good. I like it. So, yeah, when it comes to uh, even just the games, uh, you can see it's not an overwhelmingly large collection, although it's not tiny either. Uh, it gives you the... It, it's what it gives you, you know, and, 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 you know, most people nowadays, they'll look at Steam, they might look at um, something like um, Lutris, and, and, and they might look at, like, Itch.io. Um, and then, of course, you've got things like GOG, but GOG doesn't require uh, anything in the way of, uh, of what you get here. Uh, and in fact, actually, of course, GOG games, uh, they're usually at the publisher's discretion, or they're usually at the developer's discretion as to how they're packaged. Sometimes you'll get them in a deb format, sometimes you'll just get them as a, a generic binary, which is uh, what usually works uh, best anyway. Personally, and another side note, with GOG games, I usually, you know, use, I, I usually, that's where I usually get my Windows games that I play through Wine, usually older ones. I'm not, uh, I'm not too keen on supporting um, software that's Windows exclusive that's sort of particularly current but you know if I want a bit of a nostalgia trip I'll just hit up GOG.com and, um, and and find something easy to run in wine and stuff like that does tend to uh, to run quite well on wine. Okay so one of the things that I did uh, sort of notice is that you've got a decent selection of browsers you've got Firefox you've of course got Chrome on the the third party uh, list of apps uh, you've got of course you've got things like links and links which are the uh, the text-based browsers you've got GNOME web which uh, I, to be honest, I've never really gotten on with it. Usually when it, it comes across like a difficult website, sometimes something like YouTube, for example, which is a particularly difficult website, uh, GNOME Web just, you know, if it do, you know if a website does anything particularly quirky or advanced uh, or, or breaks, you know, standardization in any way, I find that things like GNOME Web and even sometimes Cupzilla, just it doesn't, doesn't work with it too well. I mean, it works for like regular, like 90 to 99% of websites, but those 1% of websites, which just happen to be some of the more prominent websites of the internet, uh, do tend to, to, to make it go a bit squiffy from time to time. Same thing with Midori, but it gives you a decent spread of, of browsers here. It gives you Vivaldi. It gives you Vivaldi Stable, Vivaldi Snapshot, W3M there, which uh, i got to say, I've never really used used that much, but um, but I know that the, it has its fans. I don't know, like, I don't know the USBI browser either. Uh, there is one vaguely glaring omission there, and that is, of course, Brave. I would like to see Brave on that list, because... Um, 
I, you know, I'm seeing a lot of problems with, you know, I'm not the, you know, I'm trying to move away from Google, particularly when it comes to browsers, because I don't like Google being my gateway to the internet more over anything else. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm finding that Firefox doesn't play as nice with Google services as it could do. And I found that the performance on Brave and using Brave for performance reasons is actually um, one of the reasons why I actually quite like it as a browser. Um, you know, because it's, you know, I mean, the privacy respect and stuff and all that kind of stuff, you know, that's great and all. But yeah, Brave is just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a browser that actually makes good use of hardware, and actually, I find it the the performance on it's really, really good, and the um, and websites render well, and um, so I would I would uh, would quite like to see that there. Now, as I understand it, people, and when I say people, I mean a lot of you guys in the comments have said that it's not too difficult to repackage uh, .deb files into um, into uh, you know packages suitable for um, suitable for uh, for Solus, but um, but it doesn't then fall into like the you know it doesn't get regularly updated and all that kind of stuff. Also, and I don't know what sort of necessarily that you know how this would fit in with the philosophy of the source distribution. Wouldn't mind seeing Waterfox there as well. I understand that because Waterfox is just a step away from Firefox that a lot of browsers don't necessarily like. To, or I can imagine why a lot of distributions might not necessarily include it. But I would like to see more distributions include Waterfox as a Firefox alternative. It's a really good um, it's a really good browser and it takes away some of the problematic elements of Firefox as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's got a decent selection of browsers. I would say probably more so than your average distribution. Um, although, of course, with things like um, Ubuntu-based distributions, you, you do tend to have more third-party support. So yeah, the, the App Store there. Uh, oh, and another uh, omission, of course, is Chromium. And um, the lack of the inclusion of Chromium is actually um, a, a, a deliberate decision Basically, because the idea uh, that Chromium, just because it's open source, means that it's like privacy respecting, isn't necessarily like one and the same. And a lot of people go to Chromium thinking that, oh well, it's just the you know it's the, the because it's the open source version of of Chrome, it's also a, a more privacy respecting version of Chrome. And it, broadly speaking, uh, I'm told isn't and comes with the, some of the same problematic elements. Uh, there are also, and I have seen over the past few months, some incredibly glaring bugs being filed for Chromium that would make it uh, would make me not really want to touch it with any degree of, of seriousness for day-to-day -day usage. Um, sometimes I use it just to, 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 to run extensions to see what they're like or what have you. Use it as a as a as a uh, yeah like a what if tool or anything like that, but I would never actually use it for anything any any kind of serious browsing. So um, at least here with, with you know you, you know at least with the Google Chrome uh, third party um, tool here uh, the browser here you know you sort you you're on the Chrome boat as it were. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I can sort of I can sort of understand that logic. I personally you know would still opt for Chromium over Chrome. Uh, given the choice uh, and given the compatibility, but um, but yeah, that's not that's not just an accidental omission. So um, I'm just gonna have a look at email clients. Actually, what does what does it give? So it gives you evolution. It gives you Kmail, and there are actually a fair number of KD, KDE sort of Plasma applications in here. Um, and I've not given them too much of a go. Um, obviously, Simple Screen Recorder. If I can pull that up here, that's a Qt application. That looks fine. I've got. Um, KeyPass. The actual the version of KeyPass that installs is KeyPass XC, which is a fork of KeyPass X. Um, I don't tend to mind whether or not KeyPass X or KeyPass, KeyPass XC is included in the distribution. They're very similar. KeyPass XC does have some newer features, but to be honest, um, you know when my password database is is strictly offline storage, um, the the basic features of KeyPass X tend to be enough for me. So. Yeah, I do have to say in general. Also, you know, there's a fair amount of news and RSS readers, and I gotta say, these days, I do find that there is a limited number of of good RSS readers. About, I think, um, Liferia is probably, in my humble opinion, the best out of the bunch there, especially on GTK based desktops. Aggregator would be, you know, it's uh, it's Qt KDE equivalent, and depending on what my um, uh, desktop environment was, would depend on. On what that is, it does appear that they've got a couple more here. I don't know what Newsbooter is or um, 
feed reader and there are a lot for there, there's a lot of rss readers that for some reason uh want you to uh sync with like a digital digital ocean dro droplet or something like that which i've never really understood it just seems like a very complicated way of solving a very simple problem rss is designed to be simple if you need a two-part you know server client solution then i think you've kind of oh you know you've you've over engineered the wheel as it were is that the expression i don't know reinvented the wheel or or um or over engineered the solution so yeah, I gotta say, despite that this is one of the most common criticisms of Solus is its alleged lack of software, I just don't see it. I see that there is less software, but I think that they're just more discerning uh, in in the um, in the selection of it. Comes with no MPV, and that is a great choice as well. That is a great choice. I'm a big fan of MPV, but I also understand that MPV is not really the kind of software that you can just bundle with a distribution. It's a very simple and straightforward uh, piece of software that runs really, really well. But because of its lack of a uh, like a full UI, uh, it might uh, put a lot of people off. So this is just a very basic GTK3 based UI for MPV. Works fine. Works great. Um, what else is there? So yeah, they've they've done a few things with the GNOME desktop. I think I've talked about the tray icons in the top there. Uh, I like that they've um, got the show applications button here. Now, this is very similar to how the Ubuntu desktop is set up. Um, and I did I did critique the Ubuntu desktop for being a little bit not as intuitive as it could have been because there were like multiple ways of achieving similar objectives um for example um you know like how to demonstrate and show your applications um so for example you've got the show applications there but also you could also um achieve that by going to you know activities and so forth as well and then that would be there so it I don't know, it feels a little bit more intuitive there. Maybe, I think, maybe I'm making a criticism out of nothing. And to be honest, Ubuntu or Solus, um, I mean, you know, in Solus, it, it does weirdly feel more intuitive than um, uh, than Ubuntu. And I think, do you know what I think this is? And I think it's the smallest thing, but I think it makes a weirdly large difference, is that the application button, the show applications button, is at the top, in the top, uh, top left. You look towards the top left for your... Um, you know your your application management stuff um and then when you've got the the show applications at the bottom there it just sort of you know uh it it it, it makes you move around the screen a little bit more than you need to of course you've got the super key and that just flags it up and uh, usually there are smoother animations there but because this is um a, an entry level laptop and because of course it is record recording you're going to see a, a reduced frame rate so um and also I do I do like the gnome desktop but it is resource intensive and it is particularly resource intensive and it does lack uh, a lot of customizability and in many ways I, I do actually consider that a good thing because I think that especially when you're talking to new users or users that don't really care for that degree of customization that you just want something that you can set up and go and with you know reasonable def uh, reasonable defaults and you know when you over engineer the customizable the cut you know the customization functions you can end up making um something you know too complicated and too breakable at that point but there are some things that i'm not too fond of the main one being that how the notifications work notifications come down boom right in the uh, in the in the center of the screen and i've had notifications come down when i've been you know and they cover like the tabs on firefox and they can cover you know parts of uh, of, of what it is you're working on because there are they tend to be a lot of application controls you know right underneath where the gnome um notification pop-ups would be if they're if they're off to the the right that would be you know less of an issue and i don't think i saw customization for that um now i've got to be honest when it comes to solus i don't think anything beats the budgie desktop and i i'm going to have to be very decisive on this this is a good implementation of the gnome desktop um but the budgie desktop is really good and it's really what I'm looking for in a desktop, and it's a bit more uh, traditional. It's a bit more intuitive. It's a, and it, and it does. Truth be told, the budgie desktop feels a bit more refined, and it feels, and it might be because it is designed for the distribution in question. I think Solus have done a very good job at demonstrating why an independent-based distribution 
uh, some of the advantages independently based distributions have over something that's based on Ubuntu. Solus could easily have built this on top of an Ubuntu base and with that same level of attention to detail and that same level of expertise of putting stuff together in a, in a, uh, in a way that feels polished and refined, you know, they could have done that with an Ubuntu base, but the fact that they could, you know, the fact that now uh, Solus can can have complete control over its, its package base, uh, its update schedule, the update uh, process was is very smooth and it's very nice. I, I'm, you know, that that was perfect. That was great. Love it. Um, and it, it the, the, it's a rolling release, so you do get the latest versions of all of your software, which is great. However, this is Solus 3, and as I understand it, it's going to be, roll, you know, it, it rolls up to a point, and then every now and then uh, there will be this um, necessity to just do a nuke and pave, to completely reinstall your uh, your operating system, your, your Solus operating system from scratch, because it will want to do like a big grand upgrade. Now, I gotta say, out of the, you know, out, out, you know, out of out of all of this. Oh, and also one of the things that I, I wasn't too fond of with with the GNOME desktop, and again, this is more of a GNOME desktop than a Solus thing, is that is the uh, the screen locking. I find that it's a bit aggressive in uh, in how it does that, and it has sort of interrupted some uh, some applications as well before in in, in weird and quirky ways. But um, yeah, so I gotta say, yeah, like. Oh, and also one one more thing about it when it comes to the, the GNOME desktop and um, and how it's implemented here um, is that I do notice that the spans uh, the fans rather spin up a little bit more on this desktop than they were on other uh, versions, both on Solus. So, for example, they, you know the fans spin up more than Solus Mate and Solus Budgie, um, but also on Ubuntu-based distributions as well. Now, Ubuntu-based distributions have a little bit of a head start in this because they do have an option to implement the uh, proprietary microkernel code and that from what I can tell seems to tweak the performance of the processor and, and, and as a result of that the fans don't wind up as much. Now the fans don't wind up as much, you know, spin up as much um, when you're doing most things but it's things like when you're watching YouTube videos in particular because YouTube is just such a such a CPU intensive website so much more than it needs to be. It's other video websites for the most part don't have a, have an issue. I think Twitch might do because um, again it's streaming and streaming does require uh, a, you know, significantly more horsepower in that regards. But um, you know, and if you are watching a YouTube video and the fans are just spinning up really quite loudly, it it, it does you know it, it it's not always the most uh, pleasant of viewing experiences there. But uh, again, for the most part, um, uh, not really an issue. I think as well there was some screen tearing in uh, and, and I have not actually experienced that on a GNOME desktop or a Solus distribution before. I think I might have experienced it on, on um, Solus Mate if you turn off compositing um, but then I whacked on uh, the um, the Solus Mate edition uh, Compiz which is their, their compositing window manager there and it did completely uh, kicked it into touch. Um, but uh, yeah and it's not it's not enough to actually ruin anything it's not big, you know. It's not. It's not drastic screen tearing, but um, it is um, enough. Uh, it is enough of a of an issue that that you can actually see it there from time to time. And it's again, it's it's usually on um, when you're watching video uh, on on the machine that you actually um, notice it. So I'm not going to show you through the system settings of this because I've done it on previous GNOME desktop reviews before. Uh, but also, there's still like a lot of personal information on there. For example, like Wi-Fi network names and um, and Bluetooth device names and things like that. Uh, that being said, Bluetooth worked flawlessly as well. Now, it, to be honest. Uh, Bluetooth tends to work flawlessly on, I think it's every distribution that I've actually tried Bluetooth on. It's only recently that I've been making use of Bluetooth um, just as a way of, of, of exchanging files between this machine and the desktop machine or this machine and my phone or what have you. Um, but yeah, uh, Bluetooth just works nicely out of the box um, as you would expect, but you know, as is achieved. Uh, so I don't have too much uh, else in the way to show you. I think the only thing where it really breaks away from a standard GNOME desktop is is, is what you can see here: the uh, the notification icons, the um, the fact that the dock is is uh, is there on the desktop. And if you've got like a full screen, so I can put up uh, I'll put up the software center. If I maximize the old software center, you see the bar goes away, and then it sort of effectively is auto hidden, and then you can pull it up there. So that's quite good. Uh, of course, with Ubuntu GNOME, uh, it's uh, it's always there as like a permanent bar. Um, yeah, it's great. It's polished. It's really nice. Uh, great user experience. Installation process was really easy. But then again, 
um, that tends to be the case with uh, not only this but Linux Mint and uh, Ubuntu. Um, I would recommend this for people who are quite happy with Ubuntu but might prefer something with more up-to-date software um, and I think that's that's uh, you know people that are you know just desktop users that might, might want something a little bit more cutting-edge than what the Ubuntu distributions can offer them. Um, it's incredibly stable. It didn't have anything in the way of bugs, um, and and uh, you know nothing, uh, you know nothing crashed that shouldn't have crashed. <laughs> nothing crashed that shouldn't have crashed. <laughs> uh, nothing crashed at all outright. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, the only issue I really had with it is the performance is not fantastic, and I think that's more down to the GNOME desktop than anything else. The, you know, like I say, the fans uh, uh, spin up more when I'm doing anything to do with uh, with multimedia. Um, and um, and I and, and the GNOME desktop is just a little bit slower than, for example, Mate and even Budgie, Budgie there. So um, yeah, uh, give it a spin if you're a fan of the GNOME desktop and you're a fan of what uh, what the uh, Solus project is doing. I really liked it, and um, yeah, and I think a lot of you guys, I think a lot of you guys who watch my videos are fans of it as well. So I think that's about it from me today. Um, just before I go. We're of course approaching December and the new year, and um, I'm probably going to be reducing the number of distro reviews I do until the new year. Uh, distro reviews, interestingly enough, actually take a lot more time than it might actually initially appear uh, because I do, you know, I usually do about a week's worth of, of testing and usage on them. And you know, the idea behind it is I, I tend to explain my, my general experience in maybe a more wider capacity rather than just go through a list of features. And you know, when I do these reviews, I often miss out a lot of features that, um, that you might see on like a new features list because they're not things that I've used or they're not things that I've come across. And you know, it would be very easy to do videos where I just read through the, the release notes of a distribution and then just spin it up in a virtual machine and yap over it. But um, you know, I bought this uh, this laptop specifically for testing distribution, so I want to put some wanted to put some time into my distribution reviews now. And, uh, and actually use this machine on a day-to-day -day basis. But, uh, you know, we're approaching Christmas now and um, and we're approaching the, the new year. So um, I'm going to spend some time thinking about where I want this channel to go next year and, um, and, and you know, uh, sort of consider it in a, in a more wider capacity. And I'm going to be doing a video... Um, sometime this year explaining you know sort of where I feel this channel's at and where I want this channel to go uh, heading forward um, because you know we you know this channel is you know this is the third YouTube ad apocalypse that the uh, that we're weathering and uh, and you know this channel can weather YouTube ad apocalypses but every sing, you know every time one comes uh, it always gets a little bit more difficult so we've got to uh, you know got to pay attention and uh, and and got to uh, get the lay of the land as it were so, uh, anyway, enough of that. I'll put that in a, in a separate video, and this video has been quite waffly as is. But yeah, uh, give uh, give Solus Nome a try if you're so inclined. I do have to say, though, that uh, overall, um, out of all of the uh, Solus desktops, um, I think the, the budgie is the one that does come across as the, the more polished and the more refined one, which, you know, it makes sense considering that it is the, you know, the flagship desktop environment for their distribution. And I probably would put the Mate uh, second place. So this is, this is definitely three out of three. Um, and, uh, and, and we are expecting a KDE version of Solus going around the corner. And, I, and you know, I'm, I, I do feel that this might be Solus maybe spreading out a little bit too thin here. Um, I, you know, I, I think that they that, that it was fantastic when it was, you know, sort of just budgy, and they had that very streamlined user experience. They sort of, you know, they very much knew what the the end, you know, what 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 they wanted the end user to, uh, what they wanted the end user workflow to look like. And I feel that, you know, now that Solus is picking up a bit of speed, and now that it's sort of spreading out a lot more, um, it kind of feels that um. The, the adding in new desktops is like as a response to a lot of people maybe requesting it 
um, and it could very well fall into the trap that a lot of other distributions do, which is just spending a lot of time on a lot of different desktop environments, trying to make sure that, that an application or a set of applications looks as good on the Budgie desktop as it does on the GNOME desktop, as it does on the Mate desktop, and, and then on the KDE desktop, and, and fitting all of that together in a way that, that doesn't make a bit of a mishmash, because sometimes, you know, YouTube, uh, not YouTube, Ubuntu can be a bit of a, a you know, a, a bit of a, a maze to navigate when you've got so many packages in the repository which are all uh, geared towards different desktop environments and yeah like Linux is that kind of platform where you are supposed to be able to fit stuff together but sometimes it does take a little bit of um, thinking through and 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 you know dare I say it, a little bit of expertise and I thought you know there was that time when when Solus was was going to cut through all of that with their with their their sort of single user experience then of course Mate came along which I thought well that was, that was alright that's good because it it gives you a second option and it gives you you know maybe if you don't have the faith in the budgie desktop because it's a bit new it's a bit contemporary um, or, or maybe you know something that's a little bit more lightweight you have that Mate desktop to fall back on in a very similar fashion to Linux Mint and then GNOME comes and then KDE comes and I don't know you know it, it's I gotta be honest. I'm. Uh, this is a great implementation of GNOME, no doubt about it. But can it uh, can it keep up? Can it stand the test of time? That's the question. So it'd be interesting to see where this goes. Anyway, enough of my ramblings. Thank you guys very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. And until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.